Welcome, everybody. This is so exciting to see you all show up for the first in our series of um, at the Eleanor William Hooker Tea Talk series. It's amazing. It shows that you've heard about what we're doing, and it shows that you're interested and willing to participate in dialogue. And this is what this is all about. It's not um, us talking to you. It's you talking with us, with our, with our um, presenters and in community so that we can dialogue and hopefully move our needles a little further, especially in this time that we're in where um, it seems like the advances that we've made over the decades have disappeared. So welcome. Please be, um, feel free to share your thoughts, um, your words, and participate in this dialogue that we have today. We're very excited to be here, to be with the, um, at the library in this public space. I want to first thank our volunteers. If they could just stand, because you know putting this together takes a lot of work. Just show your hands for the Portrait Black Heritage Trail. I want to thank our sponsors, um, the, uh, the library, Seacoast African American Cultural Center, and Paul Dowdy's production company for, hope for helping us to put this on. And um, I want to just introduce our speakers. But before I do, I just want to read a little, um, a little story that I got when we went to Warner the other day, which I thought was really appropriate for the work that we're doing and um, the space that dialogue that we're trying to open up here. And I'll try to make it quick. There was a boy whose eyes were so true and hands so steady that he became a good marksman. He threw a stone or fired at anything with his ear gun. He usually hit right on. Near his house lived a bird, and now there were four little ones in the nest. The mother bird was busy from morning till night getting worms, bugs, and seeds for the little birds to eat. One day when the mother bird had picked up a worm and was resting a moment, this boy, the good marksman, saw her. What a fine shot, he said, and fired his gun. The bird felt a sharp, stinging pain in her side, and when she tried to fly, she found she could not. Her wing was broken. Fluttering along, at last she reached the foot of the tree which held her nest. Her broken wind hurt her very much, but she chirped as bravely as she could to the little birds in the nest, trying to comfort them. All day she lay there, but as the hours went by, her voice grew fainter and fainter until it was still. The little one called in vain as they cuddled together in the cold, and at last their little chirps ceased. But for the rustle of the leaves, as the wind blew, blew through the trees, that was all that was left. Would the boy have been as proud of his good shot if, had, if he had known the whole story? So that's what we're trying to, hear, to do here, is tell the whole story, a complete story, an American story that's more inclusive and um, fuller and richer. So t today, I'm sorry, if there, before we start, if there's anybody who is uncomfortable with being videotaped or pictured, could you just let us know and sit to this side of the room? You can let the camera people know. <laughs> <laughs> except, uh oh, except our speakers. Oh, suck it up, Siobhan. <laughs> um, I think you may have to sit like this. So I'm not going to read the bios because they're in your, um, your handout. But um, our speakers today are Paul Pilot, um, Siobhan Sr., and Liz Charlotte Bois. Bois. <laughs> so without much ado, I'm going to pass it all over to our panel. <laughs> Kawhi, hello. Uh, I'm really shocked there's quite a few of you today. I kind of didn't know what to expect today. It's uh, an interesting thing to be indigenous uh, today. Uh, there's a lot of confusion of what that really means. 
We, uh, I'm 70 years old. Um, I'm a baby boomer. And uh, we came from a different time period when what was politically correct back after the war was quite a bit different than what it is today. And, you know, you see a lot of change in society as you grow older. And as I get older and older, I find that I still have that baggage from the past as well. Uh, I remember very distinctly is, uh, I should really probably introduce myself better. My name is Paul Puglio. I'm the Sagama and principal speaker of the Kawasak Band of Pentecook and Abnaki people. I'm a 15th generation descendant of the original people that, that uh, were the French, uh, at least uh, 15 generations back. Um, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, were the indigenous side, and they were both indigenous people. And I remember my grandmother, uh, we were at the time living in the Worcester County area of Massachusetts. We had a house in Shrewsbury, but our grandparents were also on the other side, almost next to Worcester. At the time, I didn't realize we were living in a, uh, a Nipmuc community, essentially, around the Quinsigamond Lake area. And I, I always thought it was interesting, as a kid in the 50s, we were somewhat aware of racial tension. But my grandmother was holding uh, counsel on a regular basis in the kitchen <clears throat> with other women of color. Because the women, I, I think, um, understood the interconnections of people. And the Nipmuc at that time had uh, a diverse uh, background as well of having um, many of their tribal members were descendants of freed slaves in the Nipmuc community. So they were a combined uh, community of uh, different shades of Nipmuc as well as the Abnaki. So seeing my grandmother holding counsel with people of color was intriguing, but I never really understood the paradigm that I was looking at what was going on in the early 50s. That being said, you know, you, you grow older and, and you go through all the cultural changes and, and at some point in your life you end up being a community leader and you have to reflect on all this stuff. And uh, I know today was supposed to be uh, centered a little bit on the Durham uh, post office issue because of the, the imagery and art and things that seem to be uh, racially insensitive. This particular cartoon up here is interesting because this is one that was, uh, it was unleashed on us, unworthy of, of the union leader. Uh, we didn't do anything wrong. Um, the Department of Historical Resources identified that the site that was going to be developed was a major uh, historical site in the Wares area of Laconia, and it's where the old drive-in theater was. The woman is a developer, and she was trying to circumvent the fact that this property was on the National Historic Register, that archaeology had been done there, and it was a, a major Abnaki site, and there's potential burials there and, and other things of uh, sacred interest to the indigenous community. Well, the Department of Historical Resources said, you know what, you have to be very cautious. This is a historical, a documented site. And we got a strong pushback. And the union leader felt that it was comical to throw us in canoes, like we were po protesting this poor woman's effort to, to um, redevelop this area, when in fact it's a sacred site and, and it has to be handled in a particular way. And this is a cartoon they came up with uh, against us, and in fact, we never really entered into the debate at all about this, other than the state said, be prepared, these people are going to try to fight you and your rights to, uh, to protect the ancestral remains, if there are any, or any other artifacts. So, that being said, art is very damaging sometimes, and the, uh, in this case, this one was a below the belt uh, hit for no reason, and I, I like to speak about that in other imagery. Um, what else have we got? Whatever you gave us. Okay. <laughs> when, when I first saw the brochure, I said, hmm, okay, here we go again. We're identified in two ways, or three ways. Reservation people, uh, living in poverty, and if you go on the public channels, everything's sad and woeful, you know, uh, life on the reservation. Or we're casino Indians, <laughs> loads of money and, you know, or we're, we're Powell Indians, we always dress colorfully. And they're all stereotypes. I mean, I was uh, discussing this issue when we, I first came in the room. I said, you know, 
Looking for diversity pictures, I, I've often gone to the federal government to see what they had for diversity pictures. What do they, what do they consider an indigenous person to look like? And it, boy, it's tough. Um, it's so tough that the Cherokee actually put up a page of what the Cherokee looked like, and they go from pure white to the darkest shade you can imagine, and they said we're all Cherokee. And I, I think that's a disarming way of dealing with racism because when we look at, and we, my wife and I consult with the federal government for the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Prisons, and they try to do the same thing with us in the, in the federal prison system. It's like an analogy would be all Asians are the same, all indigenous people are the same. It doesn't work, especially in that construct. We, we know there's 500 nations or more. There's probably as many belief systems, especially when it comes to religion, and cultural practices vary very, very much from individual to individual. So we can't all be lumped up into one picture it shows a powwow scene. And, and something like this is more appropriate in some cases when it, this is an indigenous uh, photo. It just says indigenous people. We are of all shades and colors, and we have to recognize that. Uh, what's the next one? Do we have anything else that I can talk? And then we could, I could pass it on, because I think this is a colorful. This is more of a, the diversity things that we see with the federal government now. The last time we met with <clears throat> directly with the uh, Department of Homeland Security, they were agonizing over how do we identify indigenous people. This is just before uh, 45 took over. Um, and they were all worried about what's going to mean to immigration, ICE, ICE, which was part of them. Um, well, we all know what happened, right? We were one in, year into that. And a lot of the discussion we, we forced on to the conversation Homeland Security is, what is immigration? I mean, we, as indigenous people, what if there was a policy of immigration, you know? <laughs> and oh, by the way, we have loads, scores of cartoons about illegal immigration <laughs> in the colonial era. So we could be humorous about this because it is an, a fascinating thing if we only knew better and, and, and thought more. Uh, when it comes to our people, people misunderstand who the Wabanaki are and, and the Abnaki, and they try to pigeonhole us into little buckets, and that's because the Bureau of Ethnology in the 1800s was trying to document the people they were killing off. I, you know, the Department of Ethnology really evolved out of the Department of War, the, the cavalry, the army, and they were killing us off faster than they were documenting us, so there was a, a little catch-up to figure out what the endangered species were. In the process, they identified 60 tribal names for us here in the Northeast, which were all, you know, place name type of things. I'm going to give you a little history, and our history is best said not by the English. The English have really uh, corrupted the whole history of the Northeast. We go back to the Jesuits, and we review the Jesuit notes. Just like when we talk about Columbus Day, we review Columbus's notes, his diaries. Columbus portrayed the indigenous people of the Caribbean as uh, clean, healthy, pious, uh, worthy of being slaves, easily enslaved. They didn't know about uh, weaponry or steel, and they would, they, would, they would grab a knife not knowing that it was sharp because they were so simple but so easily enslaved. Well, the Jesuits had a different take on us. The Jesuits said we were a religious and a pious and a healthy community, and um, they referred to us as... Um, enlightened or uh, human beings. We call ourselves Alnumbach, human beings. Um, the uh, interesting thing about the Jesuits is said, you know what, they reflect every time we gave them a mass, we, go, we made them go to a service, we did whatever, they'd always reflect and debate whatever we said out of the Bible. <clears throat> he said it showed a process of mental uh, agility to deal with these issues. The biggest uh, front that the Jesuits saw was the women kind of ruled the, uh, the discussion. <laughs> and, and they wanted a male-dominant thing because the Catholic Church was male-dominant. And uh, the debate always was, was, there was a friction that the Jesuits would like the men to be more outspoken, but the women t appeared to weigh everything that they said. And knowing that, and then can looking at us as being savages or uh, cruel, like, uh, do we have that Durham picture up? 
Yeah. Is that up there? There was only three. Four, yeah. The uh, Durham mural, if you're not familiar with it, it, there's a series of murals in there about colonial life in, in Durham. And one of them is a garrison, and it shows an indigenous person in the foreground with a torch. And the title is, under it is Cruel Adversity, or is it Adversary? I'm trying to remember what the word is. Cruel Adversity. Adversity. Um, and again, in the construct of what the Jesuits said, the Jesuits said that the Abnaki were com always complaining about the cruelty of the English. Waldron, for example, um, was it in 1676, somewhere around this, in the late 1600s, Waldron captured 200 Abnaki in a mock uh, battle and, and uh, meeting, like it was going to, it's a peace meeting, but they were going to have indigenous games, and then they didn't realize that the, uh, the colonials and the Mohawks that were there had real arms and real weapons. And 200 were rounded up, some were hung, brought back to Boston, hung, some were sold into slavery. Just based on that one story, you realize that the cruel adversary wasn't the indigenous population, it was actually the English. And through reading the diaries of Jesuits, there were several notations that they felt that the uh, English were very cruel in their negotiations. And most of the battles, o Oyster River, were in retribution. They were not just a haphazard situation. So when we talk about the Pescadua and all these things going on here, and it seems to be a hotbed of conversation of what happened here, because a lot of the colonial engagement was along the coast, um, you have to look at it from a different lens sometimes. Uh, from my perspective, from my perspective, I look at that and I say, that garrison of those nameless, faceless people that are hiding in there, uh, I look at it as they were cruel. They were cruel people. Whether or not people interpret it differently is a part of what your culture is. When you look at that, somebody else may say, I'm that white colonial looking out the window that you can't see through, and I'm looking at a cruel adversary on, out in the fringes of the forest. Well, it's all a matter of perspective, and, and where, as we've been going through narratives of a lot of these colonial records, it appears a lot of disinformation was used uh, to promote the uh, killing and extermination of indigenous people and taking of lands. I'm going to wrap this up because I've been told to. <laughs> I think as a, as a tea talk, we can, we can get a lot of good questions out of this. So I want to give you a little background on where I come from. Um, I'll just tell you one more thing. The Wabanaki uh, is pretty much a name that applies to everybody from the uh, Donlin. Uh, the Jesuits said it meant the ancient people that were here uh, on the coast of Donlin or the first to observe sunrise. And that goes back in the indigenous community that we were probably, and this has been, uh, we're digging up the research up in, the, uh, up in Jefferson, uh, that we were here 12,000 years ago as paleo indigenous people. And I may, in fact, be a descendant of those people. It's hard to really prove that, but 12,000 years ago, there were indigenous people here on the face of the glacier, and they were called the Wabanakiak not the Wabanaki or Abnaki, they're called the Wabanaki Yaka. And that means the ancient people from the place of the Donlin. And I'll end at this point. <laughs> Next person. Next person, that's me. Um, wow, what an audience. We, Liz and I were walking up and I said, there must be something going on here today. What are, just, <laughs> who are all these people? Um, so it's very nice to see everybody here. Um, I am Siobhan Senior. I teach Native American literature at the University of New Hampshire. And um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about literature. Um, Paul mentioned that uh, you know, art images and stereotypes and history written by the victors can be really damaging. But there's one thing that I've learned um, by reading a lot of literature, which is that we don't have to accept those images and those damaging narratives because Native people themselves have been writing a lot. Um, in fact, they, they probably were writing before English colonizers got here. Um, and certainly after English colonizers got here and sort of foisted alphabetic literacy upon them, um, they started writing immediately in English for their own purposes, to assert their own autonomy um, and power. So um, 
but I will tell you that I did not set out. Uh, I am not Native myself. I did not set out to be a Native American literature scholar. I went to grad school to do a, a PhD on Thomas Hardy. And, um, <laughs> and I still... <laughs> And I still love that stuff. If you know Tess of the D'Urbervilles, I still love the strawberry and all that. I still love that stuff. Um, but I took a class by chance on Native American literature in graduate school, and I just got hooked. And I got hooked on having all of my preconceptions just blown out of the water. Uh, and I don't think I took this class thinking that I was especially woke. Like, I don't, I don't think I thought anything of it, right? But I remember going, um, the first book we read was a book by Paul Radin, an anthropologist, and it was called The Trickster. It was a collection of stories about tricksters. And I remember being on a, on a canoe trip on Labor Day weekend reading this book and just rolling in the grass laughing because I guess on some level I had expected some sort of mystical wisdom of the elders, and this was all about coyote farting and eating his own testicles, and, and they were funny. The stories were funny, and I thought, this is weird. Um, this is weird, and so the, the Native American literature that I was reading in that class just didn't play by any of the rules that I was expecting of literature. Uh, you know, I expect big Victorian novels with lots of psychological interiority, and they, they, they played by very different rules, but they were very, very good. Um, I really got hooked. So um, sometimes when I, I tell people I teach Native American literature, they go, oh, and then there's a minute, and they go, oh, it was all oral, right? And um, no, it was, <laughs> yes, of course there were, oral traditions, there still are vibrant oral traditions, but Native people have written a lot. They've written novels, they've written poetry, they've written plays, they're on Twitter, they're on YouTube, they're everywhere. Um, you just have to know where to look for them. Um, and I consider it my job as a literary historian to kind of make sure that they're getting help make sure, I can't make sure, but help make sure um, they're getting a wider audience, the audience that I think that they deserve. Uh, when I finished my PhD, um, I wound up at a, a seminar at the Newberry Library in Chicago, which is a wonderful place to study Native American history if you ever get a chance to go there. And I was in a seminar where I was the only non-Native person there. And the Native people um, at the table were very kind to me, but they said, you know, your research is really interesting, but what's in it for us? <laughs> and um, that was something else that nobody had ever asked me to think about as a native, uh, as a as a literature histor uh, literature person, as a literature person, I went to grad school because I like books. Um, I didn't really think I had to talk to people. I'm not really trained to talk to people. I'm not really good at talking to people, but um, I found out that I was going to have to talk to people. And then I, I got here um, at the University of ha New Hampshire in 2000, and I thought, well, I, I should really teach the literature of this place. They, they hired me to teach Native American literature, and yes, I can teach Leslie Marmon Silco and Sherman Alexie and all of those those famous writers, but th there's literature of this place, too. And I kept being told, well, there, there isn't any. Um, People knew about a minister from the 18th century named uh, Samson Occam, good Lord. <laughs> Samson Occam, a Mohegan minister from the 18th century. And then from the 19th century, they knew of a Pequod minister named um, William Apess. And then it was like nothing happened um, until this guy, Joseph Bruchak, came along in the, in, the, <laughs> in the late 20th century and started writing books faster than any of us can read them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was sort of like perpetuating this stereotype, right, that they vanished a long time ago and that, um, you know, if they're, if they're around today, they're just singular, right? They're very unusual. But um, so by chance, I made a phone call. This, is, this was how I did research, right? So um, I, I imagined that it would be me, the lone scholar, toiling in the archives, making great discoveries, right, with all of the, right, discovery is a loaded term for, for non-Native people with related, to, uh, related to Native history, but um, I made a random phone call to the Mohegan Tribal Office because um, I had been assigned to write a short essay about Native American literature for a big encyclopedia of New England culture, if you've ever seen it. It was written by my colleague, edited by my colleagues, uh, David Waters and Bert Feintuck. And they said, could you do us a little entry on Native American literature? So I called the Mohegan Tribal Office, and I said, <laughs> I said, uh, <laughs> you got any writers down there? <laughs> and the person who answered the phone happened to be Melissa Tantaquid and Zobel, mm -hmm. who is the Mohegan medicine woman, and uh, who was writing a sci-fi novel at the time. She said, Siobhan, that's an Irish name. I'm writing a sci-fi novel about Irish people and Indian people. <laughs> And, um, and she started telling me about all of these Mohegan women who had been writing over the centuries and whose work 
everybody at Mohegan knew about and remembered and could quote, um, even though in many cases they had really not been published outside of their communities. So mind blown, right, for me as a literary historian, mind blown, um, you know, because I'm in an English department and the sky is always falling in English departments and nobody's reading anymore and books are going out of print in a minute and a half and libraries are dying and bookstores are dying and, and I found that there are these communities of people who are keeping their own literary histories alive uh, without any help from the rest of us, right? No fancy grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I mean, these literary histories are being kept um, sometimes in tribal offices, sometimes in tribal museums like at Mohegan, and sometimes in Granny's garage. Uh, so I, I actually enlisted the help of a dozen tribal editors, people I met and invited to my classes over the years, and I said, um, let's, let's do a book. Um, but but you, you tell me what's important to you, right? You tell me who the important writers are, and I'll just sort of mediate with the publisher. And we, we published a book called Dawnland Voices. Paul mentioned the Dawnland. It came out a couple of years ago, and it's 700 pages long. It's huge. It's a tome. And even some of the writers um, said to me after it came out, we had no idea how big this was going to be, right? Even though we knew that we had all of these writers, we had no idea how big this was going to be. And um, they kept finding more. They kept finding more contemporary writers and more texts in their archives. And um, this book took 10 years to put together, by the way. And somebody said to me, well, when are we going to do volume two? And I said, I'll be dead um, before we do. But we did, we did realize that um, there's this thing called the internet. And we could use the internet to sort of create, keep the anthology going. So if you look for donlandvoices.org, we actually have a two-part website, and part of it is a literary magazine for young writers, up-and-coming writers who haven't been published yet. Sometimes uh, fancy, we have fancy people in there, too, like Joseph Bruchak. And then <laughs> the other side is for archival work. So um, Paul didn't mention this, but for, for decades, he was putting a newsletter out, a really interesting tribal newsletter out of his basement, first on a dot matrix printer, and then you know, like, um, with incredible stuff in it, recipes, poetry, um, mm -hmm. editorials, very feisty editorials a lot of times, um, <laughs> cartoons, puzzles, really, really interesting stuff. So some of those newsletters are on our website. There's a whole a trove of them on Paul's own website. And... Um, and that's what we're doing. So I'll just finish with this. One of the things we talk uh, a lot about in Native American studies these days is the concept of recognition. Um, and recognition is sort of interesting to think about in New Hampshire, right? One thing that recognition means is that the federal government, the colonial government, reserves the right to confer recognition upon, tribe, on, upon tribes. And um, that's really rude, right, in all kinds of ways. Um, and in New Hampshire, we don't have any federally recognized tribes. We don't have uh, formal reservations. So it's a little bit different here, I think, than being even in a place like Maine, right? Where Maine, you know, they see Indian Island. They see the federally recognized Penobscot tribe going to battle with the EPA. Um, what we have in New Hampshire instead are lots and lots of people like Paul and Denise and Liz who are quietly <laughs> keeping the culture going and quietly doing the work and the activism. I'm sorry, Paul is quiet? Never. Making baskets, doing the writing, doing the work um, without recognition from the colonial settler state. Um, and one thing we can do as non-Native people, I think, is give authors and artists and political activists the recognition that they deserve. By listening. That's all I got. That's... Sorry, I had to. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Cute. Kwai, and Eloise, Elizon Bat, Shalabwa, and Dai Warner, Nia Wobonokik. So I just said hello. My name is Liz Shalabwa. I'm from Warner, and I am from the people of the Dawn. I'm Abenaki. Um, so my little intro is going to go in a little bit of a different direction. Um, I definitely involved, am involved in um, current events, um, but I'm going to talk more about um, reclaiming Native culture, which is our tagline here. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I do that. Um, and yeah, I definitely am 
a political person, um, as much as I hate the idea of it. Um, but some of the ways that I work on um, living my indigenous life and making sure that my traditions and my history continue is by teaching by example. Uh, and I do that in a couple ways. Uh, I am a parent. I have a 15-year-old who is actually here, probably bored out of her mind right now. <laughs> um, and that uh, I drag her kicking and screaming to Native events on a regular basis. Um, and she tries to tell me how much she hates it. But um, she knows how to grow food. And she knows how to argue with her US history teachers. Um, and she knows how to intellectually dissect history textbooks. So that tells me I'm doing a pretty damn good job. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and now that I've thoroughly embarrassed her, um, <laughs> uh, so, so I really um, go through life and try to carry myself in a good way. And I try to stick to the teachings that I have from my parents and from my grandfather and, and from other elders in my community that I respect. And I try to you know, stick with those teachings. And I try to uh, be a good role model for Abenaki and, and youth from other tribes as well. And, and I keep saying I'm like everybody's auntie. So I have a whole clan of little nieces and nephews right now who actually aren't biologically related to me, but they all consider me auntie. And they, they respect me and they, they watch what I'm doing. And so eventually they're gonna model that behavior and that's going to help keep our, our community alive. Um, some other ways that I make a point of um, reclaiming my native culture. And I was raised native. I've been in the native community my entire life. And I, I'm actually a little older than I look. I'm 43. So um, by my saying my community, it's, I'm not talking like 15 years old. Um, so uh, I come from um, a relatively traditional family. My mother, is, as these people can attest, is, is a relatively strong personality. Um, and she's definitely, uh, <laughs> she's, she's one of the best people I know. Um, but she is, um, she is a, definitely a wealth of knowledge and makes a point of um, also carrying herself in a good way. And I, you better believe if I step out of line, my mother is still going to hear about it, which means I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> so uh, one of the main focuses of the work that I do, and uh, I'm a nurse, so I work in healthcare. Um, it's my job to take care of people, which also, you know, explains the whole auntie thing. I'm, you know, I'm a mother. You know, that's what I do. I mother people. But part of that role is feeding people. And feeding people is really important. So one of the main things that I do is I work really hard in uh, food sovereignty and reclaiming food waste. Um, so I am a seed saver. I grow all indigenous plants. Um, I get my seeds from other native um, seed keepers, and I make sure everything I grow is indigenous, um, meaning that you know it came from here. It didn't. It wasn't imported. And we have a real. Um, our food system is very interesting right now because when all those people came over on boats, they also brought their plants with them. They brought their seeds with them. They brought apple trees and they planted them. And that's not to say you know I love a good apple. That's not to say I don't love those foods, but they don't belong here. They're not indigenous to this area. Yes, they can grow, but some of these plants are also, um, you know, they're invasive and they're killing out our indigenous flora, which can be kind of dangerous. You know, think of, you guys probably all see it along the highway, the bittersweet with those orange berries. That's not indigenous from here, that's a Japanese plant. And it comes in and it, it kills all the undergrowth. So some of the plants that we have are extremely useful and some of them are not. So part of what I do is, is trying to stick to the foods that our bodies are meant to be eating. Now, we always hear about alcoholism with Native folks. We hear about diabetes. We hear about congestive heart failure. We hear about hypertension. Well, the reason that Native people have these diseases at a far greater percentage than any other race is because we're not eating a pre-colonial diet. We are not eating the diets that our bodies are genetically made for. 
Um, and that gets to be dangerous. So, you know, and there's a, there are a whole lot of components to that between the introduced foods, between the reservation diets where, you know, Native folks were given what the Army wanted to give them, which was flour and lard. I mean, no wonder you're having heart attacks, <laughs> you know? Um, um, so a lot of my work involves teaching about these food ways and preparing foods in an indigenous way and eating more indigenous foods. And my daughter hates it. She, she hates it. She's, but every once in a while, I force her to eat wild rice or salmon. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's more complicated than that. It's, it's also, the, there's a component with, you know, seed saving and, you know, and uh, we've all heard of the crying Indian with the litter, you know, with the, who ironically was Italian. He wasn't even Indian. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, there is a relationship between Native folks and nature. It's inherent. It's in our DNA. You know, we are able to survive and still survive despite cultural and actual physical genocide, because that's what this country has gone through. We have gone through genocide. Um, and we are still here. You know, my daughter, my nieces and nephews are an example of, you know, strength and cultural resilience. They are still here. Um, so our relationship with the environment around us is extremely important. And part of that is our relationship with our, with our seeds. Um, you know, a Mohawk elder told me once that when you save a seed, you have to consider it a member of your family. You have to think of it as if you are married to that seed. Um, any relationship takes work, and that includes the relationship you have with your food. Um, you know, and, and another friend of mine, Rowan White, who is Akwesasne Mohawk, who actually has a farm in California. She's a little displaced. Um, <laughs> but um, she is famous for saying, how can you call yourself sovereign if you can't feed yourselves? So that's why so food sovereignty is so important and, and eating the foods that your body is made to eat. Um, and it may seem like talking about seeds and food is a little bit off topic, but really it's not because culture, you know, and we all have traditions surrounded, surrounded by food. And how do you get food? You, you grow it. So, and you know, we have planting ceremonies and we have those relationships with our seeds and that's what's important. Um, some other things that we do um, to sort of reclaim our native culture is language reclamation. Um, my tribe's language is Western Abenaki, and that's the language I introduce myself in. And so I am not fluent, I know that, but every day I try to learn a little bit more, and I try to uh, boost my, um, my vocabulary, and I attend um, language gatherings where we speak in Abenaki. And, and I yell at my kid in Abenaki, so, you know, she's going to grow up, and her memory of me is, yep, my mom yelled at me in Indian. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it, saving a culture is complex and simple all at the same time. It's just, it's just the way you live, but there are different steps in that. And, you know, like saving food and saving language is important. Um, but one of the other things, and I, I think I'm probably close to my time, but I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, especially in New England, um, is a cultural resurgence. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a quote in here. Um, in, in the little blurb about this talk about how um, New Hampshire's indigenous people killed off by disease and war. Well, actually, no, that's not what happened. What happened is eugenics, um, where the state governments actually physically <laughs> went after Indian people and, well, undesirable populations of which Indians were um, and were, had under legal right to uh, medically experiment or sterilize uh, Native folks until the 1970s, so that's within my lifetime. Um, there was a law on Vermont's books. Um, so if it's not safe to be your culture, you do what you can to survive, and sometimes that means uh, those of us who can hide in plain sight, we do that. And so as Paul mentioned, there was definitely in New Hampshire a concerted effort to write Indians out of history. 
But that doesn't mean they weren't here. What you see is you'll hear stories of gypsies outside little towns, and those were the Abenakis. So because what we would do, do is we would move into communities and live on the outskirts in small family groups. We were never, ever a big settlement tribe like you think of with like the Lakota Sioux or the, the, the Diné, the Navajo. That, that wasn't how our tribe got, you know, we didn't, we didn't work like that. Most of us don't like each other that much. So, <laughs> um, and, and that's not something new, that's historical. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when they say all the Abenakis died away, no, that's not true at all. We just got really good at hiding. And, and, the, the, and it seemed to go in line with what the, uh, what the historians wanted to see. So, you know, hence the, the Indians living on the edge of the town. Oh, no, they're, they're gypsies. They're not Indians. There are no Indians here. Like, even in one of the branches in my family did a family genealogy, like, I don't know, 20 years ago. And she swore up and down, there ain't no Indians in this family. Well, <laughs> I think you're wrong. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, so what we're seeing now is that it's, it's a little safer to be an Indian now. So we're seeing a cultural resurgence. We're seeing more pride. We're seeing more people attending powwows, even though it's not our way, because there's a pan-Indianism. There's a, you know, it's other tribes. We're, we're finding sisterhood and brotherhood with those other tribes, and they are sympathetic to, to what we're going through as Eastern people. And... Um, so we're seeing more art, we're seeing more music, we're seeing more dance, we're seeing more literature. You know, it's safe-ish <laughs> right now for us to, to be who we are. Um, so Eastern people are certainly more visible, not only in our non-Native communities, um, but also um, in the greater Native American community at large, which is super important because you know it tells us that after 500 years we're not alone, um, and that's that's really nice. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess yeah, I guess I'm gonna wrap up, and I think we're we're ready for questions. Um, yeah. Well, I want to thank our panelists for opening us up to the dialogue first, and we'll go into Q&A. But I just wanted to mention that there was just an article in Facebook um, that I saw this morning where they were at a protest mm -hmm. in, um, in Arizona where they, <laughs> <laughs> where they just asked one of the legislator to prove, Navajo legislator, to prove that he was not an illegal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was confirmed by Snopes that this was an actual thing that, that it was actually, <laughs> it actually happened. happened so yeah he was he was a he was a Diné congressman that a an irate uh protester demanded to see his papers you know that you know we're pretty sure that you're not legal um <laughs> so um <laughs> Janet Drew from York, Maine. I just wanted to say it seems that the country moves from one villain to the next. Mm -hmm. And right now you're, you know, we've moved to new villains. The, the, new people are savages. New people have to be <sighs> abused. I don't have a question. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunately true. Um, uh, we live in a, a country and... You know, we've seen this over the last, you know, two years, I think, where um, differences were celebrated and protected to an environment where it's not safe to be brown. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I, I understand that I'm a pale brown person, but I still am a brown person, you know. And um, I remember the day after the election, there were a lot of people who were like, you're overreacting for being afraid. <laughs> but yet I'm hearing, I'm, I'm seeing posts from my native cousins, brothers, uncles, who in a very real sense 
could lose their lives because of the color of their skin. So we live in a very frightening time right now. And you're right. There is always someone who is the bad guy. And, you know, the media certainly contributes to that. Hi, I'm Angela Matthews. Thank you for that really wonderful program. It was just so interesting. So my question is, uh, recently, maybe within the last year, six months, um, there were stories in the paper about a reconciliation project in Maine among the Native American population in that state. And something that was I, I was so moved by that it took place all over uh, Maine and uh, surprised to see that the governor of Maine actually went and <laughs> represented the state at this and was very respectful in the process. And they had a closing ceremony for this reconciliation process that took place statewide. And I'm curious to know if something like that is going to happen in New Hampshire, which I think would be a really <laughs> exciting and wonderful thing to do. Um. Our exposure, at least our tribal exposure, uh, to Concord has been a mixed bag, <clears throat> to say the least. We, uh, we champion the, uh, the legislation for the uh, Commission of Native American Affairs uh, back a few years ago. And uh, it was a difficult process. Uh, I, I was not prepared for the racism that uh, was bantied about by our elected officials. Um, especially in closed door caucuses, which uh, were it was shameful conduct. Um, they justified it because they said they had killed us all off because they came from colonial Yankee roots, and they, according to their family histories, we were all killed. And anybody that's left here is not what they are. They were French people that snuck back or whatever. <laughs> but this goes back to that that whole discussion of about. Where does racism really evolve from? I mean, you, you deal with uh, the unknown and ignorance, and that breeds that fear. And we've all heard these cycles of uh, racism, and fear brings anger and, and the other things that are uh, attributed to racism. We think the best way to deal with a lot of this is through education, and hence why we're spending a lot of our time. Uh, we do PowerPoint presentations all over the state uh, as requested. Yeah, we don't. We don't demand to be heard, but we're getting an interesting following, and, and things are changing here in this area. Over at uh, Old Berwick, Maine, um, that historical society has been bringing in a lot of uh, Native American literature into the uh, Berwick Academy and having a presentation every month, and that happened all last year. It was interesting because it was a mixture of academics and uh, indigenous writers as well, and people are starting to re-examine the, the cultural par paradigms that were here. I've been lecturing for years about a guy named Kenneth Morrison who wrote The Embattled Northeast. I didn't realize I was promoting a book that's now become so expensive to buy that I couldn't buy another copy of it because it's become a rarity. But he talks about the seven paradigms, especially in the Piscataway area, although he never really identifies it as such. He talks about seven paradigms which shaped what happened to the Wabanaki, the Abnaki. And then it included the common things, the disease, uh, warfare, uh, land, uh, settlement, uh, and a whole bunch of other. There were seven constructs that he, he analyzed. But it came down to, again, that education uh, against that fear of who we were uh, was what really shaped us. And uh, yes, we did get acculturated, assimilated into the culture. Uh, did we know English? Yes. We knew some English. We knew some French. We, we probably knew Latin. Uh, so we were a pliable community that was uh, worked with the Jesuits, unfortunately, and, uh, and uh, we are monotheistic, and uh, Angela first learned that. I know Angela from Star Island, and we've worked for years with Angela. Um, at first, the Unitarians thought we were a, a polytheistic uh, culture, and the Jesuits always said we were monotheistic. Uh, we actually had to adopt our religion to fit in with the Catholicism to some extent. And we created specific words because to us the creator was a mystery. It wasn't a male or female entity. So the, the Jesuits had a hard time with that. And you know, remember I talked about the women running the show. Oftentimes when we talk to the, the priests that are in the federal system working on uh, Bureau of Prisons, we refer to the uh, God is the Holy Mother. So we always get a little stir out of them by saying that. 
the, the key thing here is education, and we have an intern team working uh, with the anthropology and archaeology department in UNH. And we're trying to reshape what the Abnaki looked like, uh, one person at a time, sometimes one school at a time. It's just like the mascot issue. People always beseech us to step in and, and referee these battles. This has to start at the grassroots level. We have to change how we think through education of our children, and it's going to take time. It's like Columbus Day. Uh, we're battling that battle right now uh, in the State House under HB 1604 to change uh, Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. As you know, you Durham. Can clap, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's, that's all indigenous people, though, you know? You know, you got to think about that. And um, it's a big push. Um, we have some opposition from, you know, some top Italian <laughs> politicians in the state. And uh, we won't mention any of them because they're very well-known people. Um, but they're the same people that push for casinos. So it's kind of like a two-edged sword, you know? <laughs> Well, and that actually leads me to a point, too, yeah. to, to answer your question, is that, you know, as far as any sort of rec reconciliation with uh, New Hampshire, they'd have to first admit that we exist. Uh, New Hampshire has a very head-in-the-sand approach when it comes to Native folks. Um, and, and let's think about the climate right now. There are federally recognized tribes in Maine. There are federally recognized tra tribes in Massachusetts. There are recognized, state-recognized bands in Vermont, and there are Canadian First Nations in Quebec. So all around New Hampshire, there is recognition for indigenous people, but we are somehow in the black hole of there not being any Indians here. <laughs> so at, tell me how that happened, because I'm a little confused. Um, so, you know, if New Hampshire admits that there are actually indigenous people here that have always been here, that means they have to, you know, do stuff. Mm -hmm. And they can't, you know, and they are, um, I, I, it does, well, probably not as much as you think. But, but I think, yes, in their minds, I think that there is a huge amount of fear on the legislators' part that if we gain some sort of recognition, we're going to have a casino in Concord. Uh -huh. You know, well, you know, let's be honest. How economically viable are the casinos that the state are going to run? You know, are we going to are we going to follow a failing business model? I mean, I don't think so. So, you know, one of the ways that, you know, and I'm going to speak for Paul here a little bit and for myself and other native folks in New Hampshire, one of the ways that we combat that and, and get around that idea that of there aren't any Indians in New Hampshire is that we make ourselves visible. You know, whenever the paper asks us for an interview, we go on record that our name is there and that we say that we're Abenaki. We go on record saying that we're an artist, that we're an activist, that we're, you know, the work that we're doing. Because if it's in the public record that there are Abenakis in New Hampshire, in Concord, in 2018, then chances are pretty good there are Indians in Concord in 2018. Okay. Thank you. My name is Charlene McCall, and it's not a question. It's advice and guidance. My great-grandmother was a Cherokee, but because of, like Paul said, the discrimination of their generation, it was not documented. We mm -hmm. didn't have that documentation. And I want to find out, what do I need to do? To do I know her name, you know, but where do I go <laughs> to find that? Because, you know, our records just weren't there. Well, you know, the uh, Cherokee used the Dawes rules. <clears throat> this was the unfortunate time in, in Jackson's period where, you know, the rules of the Cherokee were established. We know there were mixed uh, freed slaves, you know, living with the uh, Cherokee as well. Um, you know, the Cherokee did kind of like push out the darker, you know, community family people. I don't know how that actually got resolved because they were accused of lateral racism of forcing out their own people. But that's not uncommon with federally recognized tribes. I mean, uh, we've done a lot of case studies of the Mashantucket Pequot, and that's a mixed group. And, uh, and <clears throat> when Skip Haywood took you know, that initial step to threaten the federal and state government to get you know, Mashantucket uh, Pequots recognized, he was, you know, he basically got forced out of his own tribal council over time. But it's just funny how those paradigms work of uh, internal racism within groups, and, and that it still exists to some extent. 
The Abnaki have always denied there are any black Abnaki, but we are pretty sure we've documented there were. And um, it, it, it comes down to the Gilmanton area. Um, there, was, there was a story, and it was, we thought it was funny because Channel 9, you know, the uh, Fritz Weatherby thing, he, he talked about Portsmouth at some point. We think it was probably the slaver hunt. The, the slaver that, you know, went from Africa to, the, to this continent and kept on stealing slaves and going back, about the same time as John Smith. And Fritz Weatherby said that there were an escape off of a ship off of somewhere at the coast here, and four people swam ashore. He identif- the way Fritz identified it were two African slaves that were not yet into the slave trade, but were being taken there, and two indigenous people, and they've jumped ship and swam to shore. And we follow that story to Gilmanton, and we think it was the Plassoir and Sabatis, which it turned out that they were indigenous people. They escaped, went up to St. Francis, to Odenak, and uh, two uh, African people that were with the two indigenous people from here were baptized St. Francis and St. Saint, uh, Saint Sebastian and St. Francis, hence Sebas, uh, Sebatis and Plassois. And there's a story about this, and we, we followed this line, and so did the Pequots. They were really interested because they've been trying to find uh, African Americans that married into the tribal groups earlier than expected. You know, everything is kind of later. Uh, after the Civil War and just before the Civil War, there was a lot of marriages, but this is going way back in colonial time period. But even our Abnaki in Canada said, oh, there were never any black people here. But we, we're pretty sure that there were some intermarriages way, way back, that far back. So um, the French in the indigenous community are basically colorblind. There's no, there's no shade Asian. And uh, we found historically the French seemed to marry every indigenous community they ever went to, whereas the English were very narrow-minded about intermarriage. Because <laughs> everybody hated the English. Right. <laughs> So, enough said. Uh, let's, another question. I think we can Yeah, we have topic. another question yeah. right here. Uh, I just want to thank you for your presentations uh, because it, it's an education for, I'm sure, a lot of us here. Oops, sorry. And uh, I'm Bobby Beavers. I'm from uh, South Berwick. And I do have some brochures this year. We continue uh, Forgotten Frontiers and more lectures at Berwick Academy. And also... We're now open January, February, March, and April on the fourth Saturday Mm -hmm. of the month. So hope some will come and visit it. Uh, That's a good plug. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, uh, the other thing I I wanted to comment on was this Truth and Reconciliation Commission that our state of Maine formed. And it it, uh, accomplished a lot of good things. Uh, but, and the governor may have attended at some point, <laughs> but as a person who spent, the, not last year, but the previous six years in the Maine legislature, I can tell you that I had to sadly walk out with two of our tribal members out of the chamber. They were recalled by their tribes because of the disrespect mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. our governor. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it isn't, and I can remember, I mean, that how much effort it was to try and restore language, mm-hmm. uh, their language. And, mm-hmm. But I know that there is also a fair amount of, uh, of native le- literature mm-hmm. in Maine as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, I'm hoping <laughs> in a few months that we'll see something different and somebody who is supportive uh, of our, our tribes and I think we are the only state in the nation that has three tribal members, I, although two of them are missing. I don't know if any of either of those two came back uh, for this session because I haven't been there. Um, but uh, we had three, we had three. And, and they, uh, the, and there is a fourth tribe that hasn't that is recognized but is not represented. And that's the Micmac, but. Uh, they're a wonderful group of people that I enjoyed working with, and I found very helpful some of the work that I did there. And so I, I hope at some point you get recognized in New Hampshire and, and, and can be part of your legislature, too. 
Let me just talk about recognition a little bit. P people think, why don't you just do it? Why don't you get recognition? And uh, you don't quite understand the principle. Typical of Washington, they made it into um, an almost an impossible mission. The tribes that uh, have been more recently recognized, like the, the Mashpee Wampanoag, spent millions of dollars uh, to pursue their recognition. They went through almost to uh, two or three generations of people. Uh, their petition was languishing for, what, 25 years, something like that. Um, and they actually set case law, and, and I follow indigenous case law. Uh, it's what you call U.S. Title 25, or Indian laws, U.S. Code. A tribe can only be made or, or terminated by Congress, and most of the groups that were recognized uh, by the federal government it's almost like a two-edged sword. Usually, uh, in the early days, in the 1930s, uh, tribes were forced to, to put that the president of the United States is their supreme uh, chief uh, of their tribes. And the president, they always assumed it was a male president, by the way, that he could determine, you know, terminate them at any point, or Congress could. So after Mashpee went for a land claim down in, uh, on the Cape, they would deemed not a tribe by a federal judge under another you know, in a prosecution on a land claim. And it turned out it set case law that the Wampanoag didn't have to prove they were indigenous. They had a legitimate land claim. Another case occurred up in Missisqua with the uh, Swanton, Vermont group of Missisqua Abnaki, where they were trying to repatriate. Sent another case law because they were denied uh, to repatriate the human remains that were dug up in a place called Monument road mm -hmm. yeah and it said another case law and it said a tribe is a tribe as long as they declare themselves a tribe and you cannot deny that so I started doing research on constitutional uh, issues turns out um, we're recognized by Washington the Abnaki are recognized by Washington during you know the revolution but uh, laws and treaties were made the J and uh, and the intercourse act with two of them which was supposed to protect us so we could cross back and forth to Canada and, and maintain our homelands here, all of which fell apart very quickly because they displaced us. Um, when you look at that issue and then you look at what happens in Concord when we went through the uh, Commission of Indian Affairs issue, um, right on the House floor, the first thing they did in the debate was they brought up my name and I wasn't on the bill. I shouldn't have, uh, my name doesn't associate with the bill at all. But they brought up my name and said, yeah, that Pulio is going to be building casino at uh, Sunapee. <laughs> well, it goes back to uh, AP wire service release that was done probably by Delisandro. And we're in the AP wire service. And I, at the time, controlled about 140 acres budding up to Mount Sunapee. They put two and two together that uh, we were planning to work with Okemo to build a casino in Sunapee. So here's the poor postmaster who was also the head of the selectmen. She had to deal with the wire service. Shaheen had to deal with the wire service. And I was, had to deal with the wire service that none of us knew what was going on. But that, that change, that, that, that gossip was, what, 20 years old? And it came up on the House floor recently when the commission was formed in, what year was that? It was like seven years ago. Seven years ago. And I mean, 20 years later, they're still bringing up, oh, you damn Indians are here and you're gonna build a casino. And <laughs> that wasn't part of the discussion. It was about getting a commission to, to deal with indigenous affairs. So is there a prejudice? Will the state ever recognize us? I really doubt it. Uh, they are so set that every time that we bring up anything about indigenous people, they, they talk land claims, casinos, uh, welfare, and all the negative things that don't have anything to deal with our recognition as a people. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Will we ever get state recognition? Um, what happened in Vermont may never happen here in New Hampshire. Uh, there's a strong prejudice, and uh, we're not going to change it unless we change our whole... This is going to be a generational thing, bluntly. Uh, people think being a, a tribe, you just declare it. There's seven issues when you declare yourself as a tribe. Everybody thinks just show your genealogy and you're all set. The, the devil in this is one of them, and it says you have to show continued governance for the last 
several generations, maybe 100 years. I think it's 100 years. 100 years. How do you show tribal governance? They, they're looking for a chief, a war council, a whole hierarchy, when we're nothing more, and I'm going to tell you another little side story, because I love to tell, that's why they say I never <laughs> stop talking. The Abnaki, the Wapanaki, consider ourselves all an extended family. And that extended family, as we've determined what happened to the Wapanaki, what happened to the Abnaki, we noticed some fall, small footnotes. The Abnaki considered the Penobscot a sister tribe, the Wampanoag a cousin tribe. We were so extended that we referred to ourselves as relational family members. That tribe is an uncle tribe. That one's a grandfather tribe. So what happened after those in paleo indigenous people dispersed? They recognized that this was a cousin, uncle, an aunt, a sister, a brother who left and formed another tribe. Not a different tribe, just another place named tribe. So with all that confusion, the federal government wants us to identify each one of us as a separate entity with its own tribal governance, when in fact we were related all by grandmothers. So, <laughs> welcome to the, the oh. problem of identifying and approving to the federal government we still exist. I could go on and on. So <laughs> he, he could. Uh, so a, I see that you have a question, but I just wanted to add something really quickly that's actually very surprising that came out of this administration. Last week, there were actually, I believe, six tribes in Virginia that were granted federal recognition and Trump signed off on it. So these are Eastern tribes that have been going through the same issues that the Abenaki people that have been going through that now have federal recognition. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, well, it, it's a possibility. I signed it. I'm very surprised. But, but culturally, <laughs> OK, go ahead. Hi, I'm Ken Jeremiah from Newmarket, New Hampshire. Hi. <laughs> and uh, you guys have done a marvelous job. Uh, you've done a marvelous job Thank of uh, bringing us up to date on what treatment of the indigenous people has been since its early days up until the current time. Is the USA unique in this respect in the treatment of indigenous people, both historically and currently? Um, how do we compare? Well, you know, that's tough. Um, Canada also has a very contentious relationship with their native people. I think that the current PM is better um, as far as indigenous people and the whole walking with our sisters movement. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that. Um, walking with our sisters is a movement that um, brings attention to the highly disproportionate amount of Indian women um, that are missing and murdered every year and not investigated. Um, just being an indigenous woman increases your risk of being abducted <clears throat> or murdered exponentially. Um, so there was a good, a, a huge movement, I would say, four or five years ago to really bring these to light. And this was when Stephen Harper was still PM of Canada. And most of these cases were never investigated or they were slipped under the rug. And so it was a, an active movement of Native people and their allies um, really bringing this to light and trying to affect systems change. And, and I believe that it has. And um, Mr. Trudeau has certainly helped with that. However, we also see Canada with the tar sands and the pipelines that are destroying indigenous communities and boreal forests and really extremely pollutant uh, materials in our land and our water sources. So um, to say that the United States is unique, um, I don't think so. Um, and just as a little aside, um, Hitler's plan for the concentration camps and, the, and his anti-Semitic policies were based on the United States' treatment of the indigenous population. Yeah. So just, just think about that for a second. Um, and also think about the direction our country is going in now and why, how, how this life is so terrifying. Um, so I think that wherever you have a colonizer 
attitude, manifest destiny, let's get more land. Um, wherever that attitude is, you're going to run into some con contentious relationships with the native folks. You know, our idea of land ownership is different, and, and that is part of where the issue is. However, you know, even going back to this cruel adversity thing and the Oyster River and all the conflict, think about this. And I love this, this meme on Facebook that I saw about either Columbus Day or Thanksgiving, take your pick, about saying, you know, let's celebrate Columbus Day. We're going to move into somebody's house, kill them, and tell them it's ours now. So this is manifest destiny. We have, and this is the, the tenant that our country was built on. We need to get more land. Who cares who lives there? It's ours now. The moon landing, let's put a flag on it. It belongs to the United States. So as long as we have this attitude as a society, and you know, <laughs> natives have dual citizenship, we're, we're Americans too. Um, as long as we have this, this mindset, I don't see where it's going to be any different because, you know, like we talked about before, this lady over here mentioned there's always another Indian, there's always another savage, there's always another enemy. You know, that's how we, it's a psychological thing, that's how we justify being horrible to other people. We justify that they're terrible and that makes us sleep at night. So as long as our government is based on that type of philosophy, I don't think there's going to be any change, unfortunately. Hi, my name is Jack Panopoulos. Thanks a lot for sharing your persistence and the joy of your cultures. Um, my question has to do with, uh, and I don't know what the other six points of uh, proving that you are a tribe, but in reference to a change that happened at Yosemite in the last two years, the Awani Hotel changed its name to the Majestic Yosemite Hotel. And I understand this had, went through patent office and a bunch of, uh, um, uh, United States departments uh, in the government. Are there any uh, iconic places in New Hampshire um, in which the uh, native names are being scrubbed that you know of that you could share with us and in favor of something which is more um, nouveau iconic for America? Um. Uh, yeah. So I actually think something, <laughs> I actually see um, what we're seeing actually now in Native communities is kind of the opposite. What we're doing is we're naming place names with their original names in the appropriate language. So what we see in New England is a lot of pan-Indian, oh, this sounds Indian-ish names, um, but... Um, you know, well, several of our place names are actually based on our language, like the Connecticut River, or the Kentuckic River. Those are sort of bastardized versions of Abenaki words for those um, for those places. Um, but there is, along with our re language reclama reclamation projects, an effort to take place names and call them their original names, what they are in our actual languages and not some like Lakota language or just some made up Wani Washi Mushu or whatever. Um, so, so that's actually, uh, I think, really important because um, there's power in words, you know, and, um, you know, like Paul said, we're monotheistic. We, I, we talk to God every day. Uh, whether we do it in a church or not is different. I mean, our spirituality, I think, is a little different. We're not, we're not go to church on Sunday religion. We're, a, we're spiritual beings all the time. And having a connection with a place with the words in our own language is really powerful. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but uh, I actually really support the, the changing of place names to reflect what, what they've always been called, you know. Um, I had another point, and it's gone, but... Uh. Let me just... Uh, <clears throat> in 2014, you know, this area was all wrapped up in the John Smith um, 400, and uh, I, I tribal governance uh, decided to work with Star Island on the uh, 
on a counterpoint about indigenous exploration versus, you know, uh, European exploration. Smith got a lot of record for, you know, he was really a, a real estate salesman. People didn't realize that. Um, because everything you want to do is try to sell New England to, to, to the colonial royalty. But what was interesting is, um, and again, Angela was a sweetheart on this. She invited us uh, to, to give a counterpoint to what the landscape looked like. And we did a, a whole study of the place names in this area and about navigation, how indigenous people navigated. And, and what, what we did is we, we really did navigation by what we call descriptive uh, geography, not geometry, but geography. All of our place names were actually physically a description of the location. And a lot of those got morphed. One of the classics is Gonic, of, um, uh, which is part of you know, Rochester. The, the original name was quite long, but it, it referred to a place of high ground where you could spearfish salmon. And all that's left of that now is Gonic, which is the last you know, few letters. But um, the pushback is that uh, there are certain documents out there that were done in the uh, 50s. And it has a lot of the place names and the original names. Um, the Abnaki uh, attributed to naming everything at one time or another, and this may be just coincidence because we speak a, an, Al, uh, an Algonquin dialect L, uh, sometimes referred to Western Abnaki or Central Abnaki, sometimes even linguists call it the Penacook language of New Hampshire to differentiate it from uh, the Penobscot, which are, well, is a sister tribe. Remember I said sister tribe. So if you look at all of this, um, we place names a lot of things. Mississippi is a direct translation of our language. Kansas is a direct translation of the place of the uh, uh, populace, I think? No. I'm trying to remember what the tree was. But it seems like a lot of the place names across the country are Algonquin-based, and people don't realize it anymore. In, in New Hampshire, it's loaded, other than the fact we have a lot of old English town names in between all these. Uh, there are a lot of place names that still exist today. Um, part of our project with UNH is we're dealing with a an indigenous landscape project where we're taking New Hampshire and we're repopulating it with the indigenous place names and the events that occurred there. And we're trying to build a construct of a dialogue of what the colonials said about Oyster River, what we called it, and what really happened in the perspective of indigenous people or the Jesuits. So what we're trying to do is it's an educational process. I, I mentioned that before. You're going to change the people around you to change that fear and unknown to something of knowledge based and realize we've always been here part of the fabric. You hear this now all the time now with immigration. The yeah, Anak were part of the fabric of New England just like everything else and you can't take the weave out. We're still here and we, we add that color to the, to the community and our history. So that being said, yes, place names are still quite prominent here. Are we changing any of the native um let me just give you a, let me give you a case study. English names? Yep, I'm going to give you one. Do you remember how everybody was all upset about the U.S. Geological Survey Group and they had so many places called Squaw? You know, this was a big push. They were trying to get rid of indigenous things that were felt to be uh, derogatory. So the first case that I got was, believe it or not, Narragansett Territory. And I questioned what the purpose of the, uh, the federal government getting a hold of me. They said, well, we want to change the name of an island called the Quidditch, uh, which is in the Narragansett Bay. And I said, well, why don't you talk to the Narragansetts? And I, well, they won't talk to us. And I said, well, that's typical, but um, <laughs> what do you want to change it to? We want to change it to Rhode Island's Rhode Island. And they said, I don't, I can't wrap my head around this. <laughs> I don't understand the point. Now, is it the roads or is it the island? I don't quite understand. So I went through a whole, uh, I dis dissected it because the Elgic L dialect allows us to, to dig deep, and I use some references from the Natick Dictionary, which is a smorgasbord of Algonquin language, and determined that the island actually represented a real place name of importance. It was a place where the cross currents coming out of the Narragansett Bay have like a riptide because the ocean currents meet the, the river currents, and it's a place where a canoe would stop because it meets the two, two uh, divergent water streams. 
And I said, it probably significant, it was significant to the Narragansetts because it was a place where they knew the current was going to change. And it was the root words, uh, qui, which was a stopping point. So I put it back to them. And I don't think they changed it. I think they respected the fact that it had some significance in its place name. It was just an arbitrarily Squaw Hill or Squaw Pond or something. It actually meant something to somebody. And I said, it'd be a shame to change that because it really had significance historically. So I think they left it alone, but that's the absurd stuff that goes on out there in Washington, you know. I, I was uh, interested when you, you mentioned that uh, the indigenous people probably knew Latin because I had asked several years ago, several people, how our river out here got its name. So maybe you can explain it further, Piscataqua. Well, Piscataqua still refers, you know, the different colonial constructs say it was the Deer River, the Deep or Dock River. We still stick with it was Deep or Dock, you know, just like the Merrimack is kind of a similar uh, thing. It's a Deep Dock River. Um, you know, it's a devil in the detail because it's anglicized, so we, you kind of have to break down the language and try to figure out what the word actually was. The biggest uh, gripe we have, I have personally, is historians, contemporary historians have labeled the Ware's Beach area as Aquadotten, and the, the A-Q-U-A is definite, and to us that's Latin. And we think whatever happened was Somebody asked a, an indigenous person of the time, what is this place called? And for the lack of the being able to describe it in Abnaki or an Algonquin dialect, use Latin to describe the location as an aqueduct or a, a narrowing point. Now, we had it as weirs, a fishing place, but we could not convey that to them because they didn't know what a weir fishing was. So that's one construct that I think was a definite sign that we knew Latin. But the Jesuits said they taught us Latin because they were teaching us the Bible. So we, 1600, 1614, you know, Norwich Walk in that area, I'm, I'm sure we were learning Latin. There's a belt called the, uh, the Mother of Mary belt. We call it Mary belt. It's in the Schatz Museum, uh, Schatz Museum in France, in the, in the church uh, museum. I've been to dissertations about the belt in Quebec by experts, and they said, they've analyzed the belt so many times, the Catholic Church has and other uh, linguistics experts, and they said, there's no coincidence here. The Abnaki were venerating the mother of Mary, and that's why they made the belt, because the grandmother was the important one in the family, not just Mary, who was the grandmother. With that being said, they said they were pretty sure that the Abnaki knew enough Latin to even make wampum belts that were in the Latin form. They even said the way the beads were placed, it, it signified the, they were following what the Jesuits, who were scholars in the church at the time, how they wrote and how they interpreted Latin. So I have a feeling, yes, we did, we did know Latin to some extent. Not everybody, but some of those that had more exposure may have known Latin. Uh, Dave Drucker from Dover. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you, you Abnaki guys have uh, direct contact with the Wampanoag language project? And if so, uh, how you're benefiting and how they're benefiting? Uh, absolutely. Actually, uh, Jennifer Weston, who is the director of the Wampanoag language program, is actually a friend of mine, and we've presented in different things together. She's actually not Wampanoag. Mm -hmm. She's Standing Rock Sioux. Um, <laughs> but the, the Wampanoag language reclamation project is extremely interesting. I'm not sure if you are aware of the history, but the Wampanoag language actually had was, uh, had been, it hadn't been used. There were no native speakers anymore. The Abenaki, we have a few native speakers, and, and our language is sort of limping along, but one of the things that we have is we have a lot of written resources, and we have, um, I would say, five or six lang different language programs right now that all kind of work together, uh, which is super important because getting Abenakis in a room together and having them play nice is sometimes interesting. It is. Um, <laughs> but um, I think the difference between the Wampanoag community and the Abenaki community is really geographical. The Wampanoags still live 
in community structures, they are able to have their immersion schools, you know, from from pre-K to, and I think they probably even go up through high school now, where the kids, the primary language in those schools is Wampanoag. And that's really great considering what, probably 10 years ago, there was not a single Wampanoag speaker alive. Um, so Jesse Baird really um, dug that, gra- that, that language up from the ashes. And now they have Wampanoag, first generation native speakers of that language, which is really impressive. Um, so. That means that there are Wampanoag children whose first language is Wampanoag. You know, that's impressive, Mm -hmm. uh, given that the language was not spoken by anyone. Um, So how Wampanoag and Abenaki relate is that we are both Algonquin languages. Um, There are differences between our languages because the way Algonquin languages work, and Paul mentioned that a lot of those other place names in places far away from here are Algonquin-based languages. And the reason for that is, you know, language development in this continent is pretty complex. And we have major differences in language development. And by the way, language development is one of the ways that the Bering Strait theory was kind of disproven because the languages here were too complex to have developed in a short amount of time. You're nodding your head, so I see that you already understand this concept. Um, But Algonquin languages is one of the bigger bases of language. So if you think in terms of Europe, You have your Romance languages, so your Spanish, your Italian, those languages that that are all different, but they're really kind of similar. And then you have like, what is it, the Cyrillic languages, so like Russian and and those ones that have a different alphabet and um, completely different from the Romance languages, but they all kind of coexist in a relatively small area. So that's what you're seeing over here as well. So it's really not a stretch to see Algonquin-based languages in other parts of the country because they probably spoke a different dialect of an Algonquin language. So that's the difference between the Abenaki and the Wampanoag. Um, Do I see us getting to the place where the Wampanoags are now? That's a really difficult question. And like I said, that really has to do with geography. Um, There are a lot of Abenaki in New Hampshire and Vermont and Quebec, however, we don't really live close together, whereas the Wampanoags, especially the Mashpee Wampanoags, which is where this reclamation project is centered, they all live within a town or two of each other. So it really wouldn't be possible for me to send my kid to the same school that somebody from the North Country is going to simply because of distance. Um, And that sounds like a really, really lame excuse. (laughs) Um, But unfortunately, that's the reality of it. I think that um, the Abenaki, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a dialectic here. The Abenaki are working really hard on language, but they could be working harder, if that makes sense. So we're doing our very best, but we could be doing better. Um, and um, so we're getting there, um, but it is a work in progress. I, I would mention that uh, uh, the Bruchex, uh, in particular, Jesse, he uh, has two young children. He started teaching them sign language and Abnaki as well as English, and it, it shows that it can work. Um, what he did is, uh, with the combination of the three, he was able to not vocalize but use hand symbols as in, uh, symbology, must you know, like uh, sign language to convey these things, and the kids really picked up on it. Mm-hmm. The problem is, she's right, we, we've we applied for federal grants to protect our language, and the only pushback they've always said is you don't have a contiguous uh, community to to really promote this, and mm-hmm. it's a, unfortunate, we're spread out. Uh, Callan Calloway, the, uh, you know, he's the head of the indigenous studies uh, in Dartmouth at the time when I knew him, he always said for a diaspora, the Abnaki spread out all across the country. And it was no, it was, it was common sense what was happening. I, I look at our language like, like she said, is like uh, a romance language. We speak Latin, <laughs> uh, essentially, in an Algonquin uh, paradigm. Uh, our language has always been accused of being the archaic form of Algonquin. I could, we could read what the uh, Wampanoags were uh, were doing when they did their language program, as well as Ojibwa. 
So if it's true that we have one of the ancient uh, root languages here, much like Latin evolved into French and Spanish and Italian and other things, um, we are looking at an interesting time period. We may, in fact, be what we've, I've just said. We're the ancient ones of the Algonquin f family grouping. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes being the oldest one, you get neglected. Um, it, we, we've tried really pretty hard. You can tell the people here uh, are very passionate about protecting the Abnaki. Uh, and because we're so passionate, we, we become dysfunctional because we're all very territorial about protecting our, our, our community. Well, so we have a question right here. If so. you have a question, yes, let's go for it. I could go on. He can. It's kind of a silly question, but um, I agree that I think the change will come from education, from mm -hmm. the new babies that are born, starting with the new babies that are born. So it makes me wonder, are there any Native American traditions that, that we Europeans in this country celebrate even though we don't, un, unawares kind of, that we are carrying on a, a Native American tradition and not Ooh. even know it, uh, other than a, <laughs> a, a powwow party maybe. Um, and also, Portsmouth is such a food town, there's more seats here for eating than there are people here. Is there ever in their country, is there, are there any Native American restaurants? I can actually speak yeah, to that. That's, yeah. that's right up my alley. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, as a matter of fact, there are. Mm -hmm. um, the indigenous food movement is exploding right now, and I uh, happen to count myself very fortunate to, to kind of be in the middle of this. I have some, some really close friends who are indigenous chefs and who are really, really involved with food justice. Um, and I, I am not a classically trained chef, but I've somehow, through my cooking ability, been kind of pushed into this group, and you know, I'm sort of like the shy one in the corner saying, Please count me, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, there are some really exciting food things going on, especially in the Great Lakes and the Southwest areas. Um, uh, a man that I know is named Sean Sherman, and he is Anishinaabe in Lakota, I believe. And he's based in the Twin Cities in, in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. And his business is called The Sioux Chef. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of a play on words, yep. And his focus is all pre-colonial indigenous fare. Um, and he's actually in the process of opening a restaurant right now. I do believe there's also a restaurant in New York. I can't think of what the name of it is off the top of my head. But also at the National Museum of the American Indian, the Mitzi Tom restaurant um, is, is spearheaded by an indigenous chef. And they actually frequently have um, uh, my friend, who is a who is a uh, indigenous Mexican chef, he actually goes there and does programming there a lot. Um, so we are seeing a lot more um, focus on indigenous diets. And one of the organizations that I belong to, it's relatively new, is called the I Collective. And what the and so feel free to look them up on Facebook. Uh, and what the I Collective is doing is we're really trying to decolonize our diets and decolonizing education about food. Um, and um, in November around Thanksgiving, and unfortunately, I'm in the middle of nursing school, so I wasn't able to actually attend the event, but helped with the planning of it. Um, they actually had a series of pop-up dinners in New York City at a couple different restaurants um, where they cooked a, a um, price per plate dinner um, at these restaurants over Thanksgiving. And they also did a, um, an indigenous dinner for the New York City uh, community house, uh, which was really, really cool. Um, so there is some really exciting, exciting uh, food stuff coming our way. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more restaurants popping up. The one difficulty that we are seeing is that there are a lot of non-natives opening restaurants with Native American inspired dishes. Um, so, and that's problematic because then you get into the area of cultural um, assimilation and appropriation. Um, because they're saying it's inspired, they, they feel that it's getting them around that, um, the appropriation part of it. When in fact, you know, it's non-native people benefiting from indigenous diets and marketing. Um, and, and that's very problematic. Um, 
so I guess um, I'm not going to lecture you guys. You all seem fairly intelligent, but um, <laughs> uh, so so I'm just going to you know put a quick warning out and just just be a good consumer and make sure you do the research if you know if you really want to be supporting native in you know Native American. Uh, cuisine and, and, and communities, make sure that you're researching. If, if you're actively seeking out places to eat Native American fare, make sure that it's actually like a Native American chef and that the diets are actually Native American instead of, you know, some of these lookalikes. Um, Liz, I was really struck earlier as you were talking about your work mm -hmm. um, saving seeds mm -hmm. and trying to kind of reclaim indigenous food crops. But I'm wondering if you can talk kind of more broadly about that intersection between conservation and cultural heritage and the revitalization of that and how those intersect. And maybe beyond foodstuffs and thinking about the landscape of New Hampshire, the flora and the fauna more generally, and, mm -hmm. and whether there's overlap at this point or and what that looks like in this area. Absolutely. There is definitely overlap. Um, and if I accidentally leave out part of your question, just certainly let me know. Um, the difficulty, when I was talking about introduced invasive plants before, the difficulty that we're going to have now with having a completely 100% pre-colonial diet is where do we separate the introduced species from the non-introduced species? You know, they're, they're everywhere, um, from things like our medicines to their foods, like apples are a perfect example. So I guess the way that I view that is how do I stay true to my culture but still utilize foods that aren't necessarily part of my indigenous heritage. So is that kind of where you're going? Um, so the, the, sweet and, the short and simple answer to that is Indian people are very adaptable. And we're going to use what's available to us. So you know what? I use Velcro. I drive a car. <laughs> you know, I take showers. Because um, <laughs> Indians really are very clean, uh, mm -hmm. most of us. <laughs> So, you know, I strive to use things that I know are not introduced. So as far as my crops and my seed saving, even if I decide to grow something that maybe is not an indigenous seed, I might not save that seed. You know what I mean? Like, I really make a point of fostering strains of plants that I know are indigenous and that it's the same type of food that my ancestors would have eaten. Um, and I do that by keeping my crops pure. Um, and so that goes down into the ceremony and the relationship with the seeds and knowing how your seeds grow, knowing the soils that they grow in, knowing the growing conditions, knowing what they pollinate with. It's, it's a science, really. Um, and so I think that people tend to forget that uh, indigenous folks, we are very scientific, we are extremely intelligent, we are extremely logical, and so we understand plant science, we understand farming science, and, and in case people weren't aware, our farmers are our women, and, and that may seem like a little bit of a, a culture shift to, to a lot of folks in the room, but the reason for that is, is that growing food, provide, feeding people is an extension of the life-giving cycle. Women are our life givers, so it's our responsibility to also feed you, <laughs> you know? Um, we're bringing, helping bring plants to life. And so it's, it's really an extension of our roles as women. Now, why do we see in the greater community male farmers? Well, during, and this is a slightly off topic, but still pertinent. Um, during the reservation school era, there was a real um, effort a concerted effort um, to to make the what was the quote to make the the take the savage out of the Indian essentially, um, and so the way that they were taking the savage out of the Indian is they, you know cutting their hair, beating them if they spoke their own languages, um, but then teaching them real skills. And so what they were doing is they were teaching the men to farm, thinking that you know, they were making them more acceptable members of society, but what they didn't realize that they were doing is emasculating our men. Um, and that's not to say that um, women were considered subservient. 
Native American cultures are very concerned with balance. So everybody has their role, whether male, female, two-spirited, whatever. And I'm not saying that we have set two set gen genders, because we don't. We have many different genders. But what's important is everybody had their place in our community and everybody had a role. So whether you were, if you were female, you had a cert, certain set of protocol. And if you were man, a male, you had a certain set of protocol. If you were two-spirited, you had a certain set of protocol. Everybody had their role based on who they were. Um, and whenever you're asked to do a role that, of, a, of a part of your community that you're not, you're gonna feel some disorientation. You're gonna feel some uh, lack of self. Um, and so that's what these, uh, these reservation schools, these residential schools really did, is by teaching our men to farm, they were taking away their identity as Indian men um, and giving them the role of another gender. Um, so to go back to what you're saying, the intersection between like a contemporary culture and my traditional culture as a farmer is I really am doing my very best to have that relationship with my plants, with my seeds, um, and forming those marriages, um, and doing the very best by my plants that I can. Now, a lot of our traditions throughout you know, eugenics and assimilation have been lost. But on the same hand, my food grows for me, so I'm doing something right. Does that make sense? So I think the important part is just, I try to carry myself in the best way that I can and I try to honor you know, the history of the seeds, um, but also you know, keeping in mind that it's a symbiotic relationship. I care for my seeds, so they care for me. You know what I mean? Um, I hope that answers your question. I'd like to speak to a little bit about the food thing. Um, food issues, food ways. I've done a lot of studies on this and I've come to kind of like a contradictory interpretation of, uh, of our agricultural means. Uh, the three sisters, we always talk about the beans, squash, and the corn. We also, th uh, we've pretty much determined that they weren't indigenous to the New England area, obviously. They came up from the Southwest or uh, South America. So where do you take your snapshot in time? Everything I've researched, um, and this came from oral discussions with my father, we were four seasoned fishermen, first and foremost, not farmers. And as we look at the middens that are all over the place, you know, remnants of sh fishing and shell uh, processing, shellfish processing, I should say, it turns out that the paleo diet uh, didn't have grains in it like we expect. You know, like when you look at paleo diet, if you really want to go back to what the indigenous diet looked like, it was, um, I think, the, the major source of protein came from fish. And when you look at the Amazon and, and other indigenous people that are still quite primitive in these isolated places, um, hunting primates uh, puts you in an adversarial position of going into territories of other people and that leads to warfare and conflict. Whereas fishing, if you, if you look at every place name in, in New Hampshire, there's a, like, uh, Nemeskeg, you know? These were all, like, places that were named for fishing. And it's no coincidence, Garnick was another fishing place. Every place was labeled a fishing place, and, and what we do find is that probably an indigenous diet was more fish-oriented. Um, if you had to look at changing time periods. W working with archaeologists, we're trying to figure out when did corn, beans, and squash really get introduced to you? Because then it made us more sedentary, because if you look at our, our foodways, we were, we had five major villages per year, you know, seacoast, a fishing place, a place for hunting moose and doing um, maple syrup uh, production. Uh, there were different places for different purposes, and it was really following our foodways. What we can tell you is, that the suspicion is that we did trade seed stock with other indigenous groups to bring better crops here. In the case being in Maine, there is one isolated grove of oak trees that definitely came from the south, and it's just an isolated occurrence. So, um, yes, 
uh, food ways and, and saving seeds and stuff was important, but back then we were hunters and gatherers, nuts, berries, and fruits. And we loved uh, root, uh, root lilies, uh, what we call Jerusalem latichoke or sun chokes were very popular. A lot of these plants had really good medicinal properties and uh, it was part of our main diet. So as hunter-gatherers or paleo-indigenous people, uh, I think the corn, beans, and squash came later. It's important to save those because those are old world species that were not in Europe. So uh, I agree Liz is doing a great thing, but I'm, I want to push it back to the paleo point where we didn't have agriculture because that's when we had to settle into villages and that's when colonials would come here and say, oh, God gave us this beautiful field of corn that was growing. Out of the providence of God, look what was, we were gifted with. Like there was nobody to put it there. And, you know, if you look at the colonial construct, they, they did that repeatedly. Like, God in his providence gave us all this bounty. So, we're, with that being said, we're, uh, we're, okay. we, we have like 15 minutes left, and I still have three questions here. So I'm going to try to get through them before we run out of time. Thank you, Kathleen Soldati. I have a question about the future. If you could imagine, and this is for any one of you, um, if you could imagine the future and where you want to go, and, and all of us came with you, all of us here today came with you, what does that future look like? Where are we going? And what can all of us be doing to help get there? Well, um, <laughs> well. <laughs> that's not a loaded question. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think ideally, uh, well, give me a second here. I gotta, Here's I gotta, what I, I like gotta to chew say. on this. <laughs> what I'd like to see, I'd like to see the state recognize their indigenous people here and stop saying they killed us all off. Mm -hmm. Develop a real solid, um, indigenous perspective for New Hampshire and put it in the schools and stop playing games about this thing that we're all dead and gone and that the colonial construct is the only one that we have to live up to. And I think if we start in the schools, I think education is the key thing. It, 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 it fights, the next generation is not going, it is going to be colorblind if, if they're allowed to be. So I think it's the education of our kids and you know, Everybody says, why don't you take you know, on Rochester about the, the Red Raiders? It's a lost cause unless your students want to change the name of that. And you know, we've got to change our perspective of what the indigenous community looks like through education. And I think if we could all embrace the idea that we, how many times have you seen books? Lies my teacher told me, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. You know? And, and it's true, we've got to stop this discussion uh, that we're not here. And it's a, an uphill battle here in New Hampshire. Yeah, I agree, Paul. Um, education is extremely important. And I do see that there is a culture shift, and that, that's amazing. Um, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and the first step in that is, is really uh, teaching people that indigenous people still exist. Um, and, and I would not be surprised if there were even somebody in this room who didn't realize that there were still Abenakis living in New Hampshire prior to today. Um, and unfortunately, that's something that, that we struggle with all the time. Um, one of the things I, <laughs> I would love to see um, is that, you know, at a point, uh, I am an educator. I've been an educator for a really long time. Um, but, but one of the tough things about being Indian is when I tell someone that I am an indigenous person, they're like, whoa, what's that like? <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, I have to, yeah, how much are you? Can I touch your hair? Um, so I find myself frequently in the position of having to explain how I exist and what my life is like rather than just being allowed to exist. And you know what? I'm a big girl. Uh, I pull my pants on one leg at a time and, you know, and I can take that. But our youth? You know, our youth have to struggle with this too. You know, I'm gonna embarrass my daughter again, but when she was in sixth grade, and she's now in 10th grade, so uh, we come from a relatively small town, but she, you know, and in her small town, 
uh, there was no question that she was Native. We would go in every year. We would do some programming with her classmates. And, you know, they were really great, you know, sort of making our youth colorblind. But then she got into middle school, and they had to do this culture project for her language arts program. And part of that culture program was researching your family and saying where you're from. Now, sixth grade, you were how old, 11, 12 at that time? So we have this preteen child being asked by her teacher to say where she's from. And she said, I'm from here. Okay? Which is true. She is from here. We are Abenaki. Our family is from Vermont and New Hampshire. We are from here. And the teacher, this woman with a college education, in charge of molding our children's minds, saying, no, you can't be from here. Where did you come from? So put this in perspective. As adults, we have the tools to handle that. We have the tools and the language and the ability to say, well, actually, you're wrong. But we have a sixth grade child who does not have those tools and does not have the social experience. And you know, honestly, we teach our children to respect authority and respect the people that are teaching us, especially in Native culture. We have a profound ex respect for our elders and life experience. So we have this 11, 12-year-old child who is placed in an adversarial position with her teacher, telling her that she doesn't know what she really knows. Mm -hmm. So think about that for a second. We're asking our indigenous youth to teach about themselves rather than experiencing their childhood. That's a really heavy burden. So I would love to see a place where our children didn't have to teach their elders, you know, where it could be the other way around, and that they didn't have to suffer from the same identity crises that my generation or my mother's generation had to go through. So. A last question for today. My name is Rich Grossman. Uh, I just want to know how much uh, DNA or genetic testing, had, or if you did, did it or not, uh, has informed uh, your people and your migrations. And just a comment, that both of you sound so, the both of you sound so, so Jewish. <laughs> you know, ironically, I'd like to give a shout out to my Jewish community over here who's adopted us. We fondly call them the Katu Jews, and they're the Kentuckic Jews, and they've actually adopted us stray little Abenakis, so, so thank you. I will take that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> um, so to answer your question, um, I mentioned the eugenics program earlier. And just in brief, um, but again, just uh, the eugenics program was a state-sponsored program that gave the legal right to medically experiment and sterilize Indians. So I know of a family story of where someone went in for a tonsillectomy and had one of her ovaries removed. I'm like, did you get lost uh, on the route? Because um, you know they're really not in the same place. Um, <laughs> they failed their A and P class. Um, but this is a reality in our communities. A lot of our communities, and probably Paul's family has this story too, moved from our homelands to Massachusetts to become French, because it was safe. You know, my great-grandmother was of childbearing age and moved from um, Isle Lamont, Vermont, right up near Missisquoi in Swanton, down to central Massachusetts because it was safe. Um, so, um, and my grandfather, <laughs> God love him, um, was he definitely still remembered that kind of stuff. Uh, he has since passed, but one of the things that he always said um, is if they don't know who the you are, they can't hurt you. Um, so, and my mom has definitely inherited this quality, and I have. And, and when I said that it was safer to be indigenous now, it really is safer to be indigenous. However, it's not all that safe still. You know, and if they don't know who we are, then they can't hurt us. So 
my family personally, we do not do the genetic testing and we do not do it for several reasons. The first reason is if you do any of those Ancestry.com or uh, one, two, three, me, whatever, you know, all those different genetic testings, you're signing away your right to your genetic material. Right. You no longer own that. So if you've done an Ancestry.com genetic test, they own your DNA. That doesn't mean they own your person, but they own all the genetic information that you've given them, and they can sell that to insurance companies. They can sell that to whoever they want. So they know who you are. <laughs> um, but also, if you think of the science behind DNA testing, you only inherit half of your parents' genes. So even if there could be somebody who is 50% is going to show up as non-native because maybe they inherited their non-native parents' genes and not their native parents' genes. So you're not getting the whole picture with DNA testing. Mm -hmm. So, and another thing is there are 600 different types of Indians in the United States alone. So, and we're all very different, and I am extremely different genetically. And, I, you know, I'm pretty classically Abenaki. I look like a lot of Abenaki women I know. We all... We have our big, long faces and our black hair, and we, we all look very similar. Um, most of us look very similar. Um, there's definitely a phenotype to Abenaki women, but I am very differently genetically than a Diné person or an Alaskan native or even a Mohawk who is right next to us. Um, so how can they have a bank with all the different Native American genetics? when there are so many and so diverse. And if you think, you know, familial lines are huge. Like how many great, great, great grandparents do you have? You can have like 200, you know, well maybe that's, I'm, I'm at, guesstimating, but you can have an exponentially large amount. Mm -hmm. um, so not only is the science perfect, um, but it's scary not knowing what my genetic material is being used for or if it's going to prevent me from having health insurance because I have some sort of genetic predisposition for diabetes, which, you know, I'm Indian, so, and I'm eating, you know, American food, so probably. Um, I guess it wasn't asking individually. I was just wondering whether we learned something from all the genetic tests. No. No, no, and I agree with her. I mean, they, they, they really, this is kind of a, I almost want to use the word fraud because the genetic testing that's going on now is trying to, like, advertise, oh, we found Native American. It seems like a lot of the commercials show, like, it's Native American, or they're confused. I thought it was Scottish, and I thought it was German and all that stuff. I did mine well before all of this was... Uh, clever, you know. It, I did mine way back, and it was part of a research project that was supposed to find out what the Acadian roots were, wherever there was indigenous people, because uh, historically anybody had the name Roy was a royal, which meant they were probably an orphan from Paris that were, you know, forced or, or a given option to resettle here in, in, in New France, as they said. So they were interested in finding out these divergent groups of people that were brought here originally as, uh, by the French to set up the colonies. So I did mine, and, and, you know, it went back. I was a Norman, you know what I'm saying? But then that made sense because I did follow all of these lines. I did a European uh, trip last year following my roots on my, you know, my colonial side, and it turned out, you know, damn straight. I was, I came from Norman blood, but that makes a lot of sense when you look at the migration out of Africa and, you know, you know, we're all related within 50 generations or something like that. So the DNA thing right now where they're, and even Facebook has these image things, you put the, your camera up and you take a picture and it says, and it says how much percentage in Native American you are, but every time you do it, it's a different percentage, you know? <laughs> right. Um, I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think if people really want to do any real research in their family, you do your, your, your genealogy. 
The DNA thing is just a fad right now. There is not enough database information. Yes, they have Kenwick Man, they have Aussie in the Alps, they have some old you know, genetic markers. A lot of the tribes will not allow DNA testing of any human remains, you know, dug up for repatriation. So there's a lot of issues about how you're going to really identify what the DNA strands look like for an Abnaki. And here we are. First contact, we already had European blood in us, you know, in the 1600s, so it's really hard to sort it all out. Mitochondrial versus, you know, the male side of the, the, the geome, it's a mess. And um, we've studied this, we've studied this in genealogy. We do see a pattern of remarrying every seven years, almost like a um, knowing genetics. We, we didn't remarry into the family lines in seven generations, that's clanning as they call it today. I think, uh, I, I look at these things, what was making up uh, our genetic ma material, it's very hard. Even genealogy doesn't tell you who was adopted sometimes and, and who was out of, you know, like they say, born out of the marriage, so to speak. And it was, those things happened every time there was a war sometime in history. Uh, Male-female relations broke down. And so looking at genetic markers is not a precise science. It's a precise science for that particular marker, but doesn't tell you where you came from. Well, and it's also important to note that native communities are made up more of genetic, more than genetics. Uh, you can't just have descendancy to be a native person. You have to have a community connection. Um, and, and there are a lot of people who join our communities who recently rediscover their roots. It happens, you know, with all our families that we're trying to stay safe. However, it's not that you can discover your descendancy and all of a sudden be a member of the community. You know, there ta there's a lot of learning that's involved. You know, I wholeheartedly believe that we are lifelong learners. I will learn until the day I die. Um, and I was raised in my community. I know I've learned a lot in my community, and I will still continue to learn a lot in my community. But I've also earned my place in my community. You know, it's not like you can just say, I'm Abenaki. I'm, you know, I'm going to go to powwows. I'm going to go to ceremony. I'm going to automatically be accepted in my, in my niche. Um, you know, and, and if you are on that journey, wonderful. It's great. Reclaim your heritage. But I encourage you to be a learner, be respectful, listen. Listen. That's the important and part. Look on and that listen. note, that's a perfect place to end our session. <laughs> We thank you so much for I'd being I'd like to here. thank Siobhan for being here and dealing with us. <laughs> Siobhan got caught between us.